So um, I always find it helpful to review what exactly catatonia is. It is um, now kind of a standalone in DSM-5. It used to be in a add-on to things like schizophrenia in the DSM-4, but it's um, more than three of the 12 symptoms, catalepsy, waxy flexibility, stupor, agitation, mutism, negativism, posturing, mannerisms, stereotypies, grimacing, echolalia, and echopraxia. Um, here again is our overlap between autism and catatonia. And I tried to, to tease apart some things that are shared features and some things that really are more specific to catatonia as a clinical syndrome. So things like um, mutism, stereotypy, echolalia, echopraxia, unusual posturing, agitation or, or stupor, those are all things that we can commonly encounter in autism. Things we don't often see in kids just with autism are this negativism, so, um, or waxy flexibility, um, or some of the autonomic signs, like fluctuations in heart rate and blood pressure, or respiratory rate, or automatic grasp, things like that. But I think it is pretty well established that, that kids with autism and, and teens and adults have higher rates of catatonia as a syndrome, about 6 to 18%. Um, again, we're using their baseline as a tool to decide whether there is something new or different. Um, and interestingly, um, it's often catatonia in kids with autism is, is, seems to often be preceded by stressful life events, so it's good to inquire about what else might be happening. And then this is, uh, this is more theoretical, so this is something that people who have studied catatonia and autism have proposed that there are certain features of catatonia in autism that, um, that are somewhat unique. So it's, you're more likely to see um, increased slowing of movements, trouble initiating movement, more passivity, worsening of repetitive movements, um, reversal of day and night. And then um, that onset is usually somewhere in, in um, late childhood to adolescence. Um, so, again, this is probably all best done under the care of a specialist, but there, you want to include a careful history and physical, especially paying attention to um, uh, autonomic instability if they're really impaired or sick. Um, it can be helpful to use a catatonia rating scale, like the Bush Francis is the most common one. I have used that before, and I find it challenging to really differentiate autism symptoms from catatonia symptoms, but it's perhaps like the best tool that we have right now. Um, it's good to do a very comprehensive physical workup to look for other signs of illness that could also be associated with these sort of mental status changes. So, you know, our basic screening labs, if indicated, we might be thinking more along the lines of MRI or imaging, EEG, um, looking for infections that might be masquerading um, as cognitive change, um, certainly drugs of abuse, and then if there's any suspicion for some of these rare um, neuroinflammatory problems or auto autoimmune encephalitis, then you might want to be talking to a neurologist about an LP. And the, the common wisdom with catatonia is that antipsychotics can make them worse. So sometimes if you've seen an onset of this of this cluster of symptoms after an antipsychotic, you want to get that out of the picture. So, um, the, so catatonia has been studied in autism. Um, evidence is really limited to case reports and case series. There's been no clinical trials. And the recommendations that come out of those really do mirror the treatment of catatonia and other conditions too. So benzos, particularly lorazepam at a high dose is considered first line treatment. Now, did you mean 24 milligrams or 2 to 4? No, 24. 24. 24. 24. Oh, yeah. yeah, high right. dose. Right. So, I mean, and sometimes, particularly, I think, with this agitated <clears throat> cat catatonia, where you see um, people not sleeping for days at a time who are extremely agitated, they just chew through it, sometimes up to that much. Um, but if you get up that high and it's not doing much, then it's time to move on to ECT, which can often be very effective. Is that short term? Is it in the hospital? Is it, you know, do you do a prescription for 24 milligrams a day? 
I, yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> Should there be some clarification? Because we do so yeah, I don't think this made it all the way into the guidelines. Um, <laughs> yeah, but this is what, what in, uh, somebody with some expertise in catatonia would do, probably in a, in a monitored setting like a hospital. Yep. So, so benzos are usually first line, second line is ECT. That can be very effective. Usually there's some maintenance beyond the initial 12 treatments that needs to continue for, and I don't think we have good guidelines on how long that maintenance um, phase should be. And um, there's a lot of support for supportive behavioral treatment. That can be things like maintaining routine and reducing stress. Um, so again, we didn't level these, um, but we did mention that we should be consulting a specialist, and I think we just put a mention in there that, I think I added, under the care of a specialist, high-dose benzos are first line followed by ECT. 